Hello, everybody, and welcome back. We're going to be talking about some more Anima Beyond Fantasy. Uh, last time, and it's been a while, so I apologize, I talked about uh, how combat actually works in Anima and how to go through it in a very simple and basic way. Uh, today, we're talking about magic. Uh, what is magic? How does it work? And most of all, uh, what you do with magic itself. So first things first. Uh, before you need to make, before you think about making a wizard in anima or any kind of magical archetype, let's first figure out how to actually do it. I'm not going to go through a full character creation. But I'm just going to go through the very important things you need to know. Uh, the most important thing that you need to be a wizard is a very particular advantage in the core rulebook. Uh, something known as the gift. The gift itself doesn't do too much for your character. Uh, beyond the fact that if you have the gift, you can see magic, you can use magic, and you get a plus 10 to your magical resistance because you're a wizard. And that's the only advantage you need. Uh, and with getting the gift, you do unlock a wider array of additional advantages you pick in the magical advantage section. Uh, a popular one is Natural Knowledge of the Path, which gives you level 40 in a uh, particular school of magic. Dell. Aren't you getting a bit, bit quick? Schools of magic? We're going to talk about those later, but just know it's their books of magic. They, they, that's where your spells come from, basically. The higher, bigger numbers are better. Uh, next, let's just, I'm going to just look at the most common mystic archetype most characters will pick if they want to be a wizard, which is the wizard. Let's, let's be frank. Wizard is for being a wizard. Uh, illusionist is also valid if you want to be a bit more of a uh, wizard focusing on it with some subterfuge based skills. They're both they're all good. Uh, Warlock's pretty overpowered with the right style modules, but I'm not gonna go into those two. I'm just talking about magic, and the reason we're going here is I want to get the bare bones basics of what you of what magic is. So, magic is encompassed in the supernatural abilities over here, and these are and however all of these don't necessarily matter to casting spells. I'm not talking about summoning. So, Summon, Control, Bind, and Banish, these abilities are for summoning, and we will not talk about them, completely ignore them, they don't matter for this video. We're talking about Xeon, Amy Multiples, and Magical Projection, and I'm going to explain what all three of these are first. Xeon is the, the source of energy you use to cast spells. Uh, it's kind of like a mana in any video game you've ever played, or MP in Final Fantasy, or just a resource you use to cast spells uh it's your reservoir it's how much you get and that's all it does you want lots of it though not as much early on as you can see you get a bunch as well for free every level as a wizard the most important of the two of the three in my opinion are ma multiples ma stands for magical accumulation uh and to better to best explain what magical accumulation is let's go with the mad detection and go to the chart that tells you what it does so an enemy multiple is kind of like a life point multiple. You buy it, and it increases how much magic you can charge a turn and how much you regenerate per day. The amount you charge in a turn, by the way, is how much you regenerate in a day. So, every character has a base MA unless you rolled a 4 for your power stat. In which case, your base is 0 and you cannot cast magic. If you have 4 power, don't be a wizard. In fact, power is the absolute most important stat as a wizard. Intelligence is important too, but I feel power is much more important. It governs both your base Xeon, how much you have, have out of the gate, and your magical accumulation, how much you charge per turn right out of the gate. Every character has one base magical accumulation multiple, and that is basically what this is. So if you have 10 intelligence, you have 10 magical accumulation. That means every turn, if you didn't buy additional magical accumulation multiples, you would generate 10 per turn. That's pretty slow. Uh, you can spend fatigue points to generate more. I believe uh, for, ever, for every uh, fatigue point you spend, you gain 15 extra MA, as if you had 50 more MA, basically. And like with anything, you can put 2, so you can get an extra 30 if you really want to push it. Uh, but you want to buy a few of these. You want to be careful, though, because they're very expensive. They cost the wizard uh, 50 development points just to buy one. So they're very expensive. And you have to be careful how many you want to buy. 
Uh, a good number is being able to cast your a basic spell every turn. So, if you have 10 MA, for example, you might buy, like, 4 of these at level 1. Level 1, it's okay if you can't quite cast a spell in one turn. Because level 1, most of your spells, depending on what school you're in, might not be able to be even defended by your opponent. So, casting a spell every 2 turns can still be useful in combat. But you eventually want to be able to, like, generate 60 Z on a turn. Which is why I recommend having buying four MA multiples being kind of uh, meh at level one, and then level two when you can increase your power by one, and then have 15 magical accumulation as your base, and then have it go up to 60. Uh, like with life world multiples, like I kind of just there, they increase retroactively as well. So if you increase your power later on in life, you can you'll become a much more powerful wizard, and so on and so forth. Finally is Magical Projection, which is just like Attack, Block, or Dodge for Warriors. It's how you aim your spells and how you defend yourself with your spells. Uh, there are Magical Shields you can project that can protect you, and there are plenty of spells to kill your enemies with. Uh, to describe how it works, when you put a point in Magical Projection, it goes both for offense and defense, but you can skew your Magical Projection like you can with your attack and defense in combat. Uh, by 25, quote-unquote, uh, points, more or less. So your attack can be 25 higher than your defense, or your defense can be 25 higher than your attack. It's up to you. Or they can be exactly the same if you want to be a more balanced character. Uh, finally, when it comes to like the secondary abilities for wizards and stuff and magic, uh, Magical, Appraisal, and Occult are the two big ones. Magical Appraisal is what you use to... Uh, basically, it's your Detect Magic spell, is the best way to put it. It tells you how magical something is, but not necessarily what it does. That's what the occult skill does. So you use a magical appraisal to figure out that something is magical, and then you might roll an occult check to be able to tell what it does on the offset. Now, now that you know how to get Zeon, how to charge it, and how much you regenerate per day, and what your base Z is, and what your base charge rate is, let's talk about casting spells. Uh, the way spellcasting works in Anima is... It's kind of like uh, in the normal turn structure, where you have X amount of actions. Uh, casting your spells takes an action. However, if you can cast multiple spells in a turn, for example, you can you cast all of them at the same time, more or less. So if you cast, I don't know, five fireballs, like a generic spell in every game, you cast all five at the same time. But with the figure how you learn these spells first. This is where intelligence comes into play. Uh, whoops. Uh, you see this chart here, this magical chart? If your intelligence is below 5, you just cannot learn spells. Or if it's 5 or lower, you cannot learn spells. You have zero magic levels. Uh, in the expansion book, there's ways to buy magic levels to get around this. But if you have 5 intelligence, you probably shouldn't be a wizard. Let's be real. Uh, but this is your your maximum magic level, quote-unquote. This is, according to the core rulebook, the highest amount of magic levels your character can have worth of spells known. Uh under their normal, without not counting creation point uh, bonuses and stuff that you got from getting creation points. And this is how many mad levels it costs to buy a spell. So to get level 2 to level 10 spell, it costs you 2 and so on and so forth. You can also just buy levels in a school of magic. Uh, each level costs 1 magic level. So to get level 50 in, let's go with Book of Light, Light Magic. It would cost you all 50 of your magic levels. Yeah, if you had 10 intelligence. And then you would learn... And the way it would work goes when it comes to learning all the spells is you would learn all the spells in level 250. And as you'll notice, there are these free access points. These free access points are where you go to the back of the magic book, basically, to the free access spells. And you pick them to fill up those slots, basically. These are the spells that every wizard more or less can learn. So that's how you learn magic. When you actually cast a spell, though, you can cast the spell at its base level, which is what this spell would describe. So if you were to create light, you would make a light, and it'd be a light radius 15 feet. But you might note this add effect thing right beneath it. And maximum Xeon. Intelligence times 20 and the maintenance. Let's explain all that. So you can spend more Xeon to add effects. It costs 10 extra Xeon to add an added effect. 
To know how many you can add is based on how smart you are times a number. Uh, for the create the create let's spell, it's intelligence times 20. So if you have 10 intelligence, let's say, 10 times 20 is 200. That means you could buy 18 added effects to your create light spell if you spent 200 Xeon on it. Now, if this number, this intelligence times 20 for your intelligence score, is less than the base cost of the spell, you cannot cast that spell until you raise your intelligence higher. Now, maintenance in this book is kind of confusing to read. 1 every 10, bracket 2 daily? What? That's kind of complicated, and it's hard for me to explain what all what that means sometimes. Uh, but basically, the daily means you pay this cost once per day. And what the maintenance means is 1 every 10, that's 10 Xeon. I don't actually know what the bracket 2 means in this case, to be honest. It's kind of complicated. But you'd pay a Xeon or two every day for this great light spell, basically, is what that means. And that's kind of the issue with magic in the core book, is that it can be kind of confusing. Like, what's that mean? Maintenance no, that makes a lot of sense. The bracket number, I think the bracket number is how much you'd pay for the base cost, actually. So it'd be two daily. So you'd pay two a day. Yeah, that's, a, sorry, that's what it means. It's been, a, it's been a while since I've used base rulebook spells. I won't lie. They're kind of archaic in how they work in compared to other spells. But the bracket number is how much you'd pay a turn or daily. Yeah. So one every 10, that's two. Uh, Zeon daily at the base level. And then if you add an add effect, that'd be three, then four, then five, and so on and so forth. Now, the thing to note is the action type it takes to cast this spell. This is an active action to cast Create Light. But the Shield of Light is a passive action to, for, to pull up your supernatural shield. So even if it's not your turn, you can always cast the Shield of Light spell to protect yourself. Makes sense? I hope so. It's fairly simple. Uh, beyond that, uh, different spells do different things, and there are many schools of magic. Uh, the only other thing you need to know about the schools of magic are the difference between high magic and divine magic. Uh, basically, you cannot learn divine magic without having a very high genosis score. That's it. Same with high magic. You need to have a high genosis skill score to learn high magic. Uh, or that's how the game fluffs it. It's up to the DM to let you know when you can actually cast it in the core book. Which, you know, adds some more uncertainty as to when you can actually do magic. When you can break the threshold of the low magic to the high magic. Uh, there's one last little thing about magic that I have to explain. It's a bit complicated. It's not complicated, it's just a bit like, you know... It's like anima in general. You have to consult a lot of charts. Right? This game is charts the game. I'm looking for the actual entry and I want to... I'm, I'm not going to read it out to you guys more or less because it's a little ass on you. The paths of magic themselves. Now, I want to note just one part about... This describes every path, but paths have opposed paths to their own path of magic. So if you learn light magic, it's very difficult to learn darkness magic. Uh, there's basically a big, quote-unquote, magical tree, more or less, where if you try and learn spells opposed to your uh, tree, it's going to go bad for you. In other words, it's going to cost you more magical levels to learn spells that are opposed to you. Every type of sp Every spell path has at least one opposed path. And you just be always like, fire is opposed to water, water is opposed to fire. Uh, the only one that is opposed to more than one is necromancy, which is opposed to all of the magic paths. Uh, basically, though, the thing you should know, though, is that you basically can't learn spells from your opposed tree. So if you cast light magic, you cannot, you basically cannot or should not learn darkness magic. And if you go in necromancy, you can't learn anything else but free access and stuff. Makes sense? It's all fairly simple. But there's some pieces missing, obviously. Like, you know, what's this chart mean? These are, you know, some other uh, tertiary things aren't too important. Like, if you're casting a really powerful spell, this is how you do it as a ritual. This is the rules for detecting magic. 
this is the magical analysis chart. I can go through that, but that's not too important. That's something that's doesn't really need it's self-explanatory. Uh they're all the other thing I, I wanna explain as well are spell features that come up. I'm just gonna go through all these because they are very they're they're important. Uh, effectful presence, as you probably know, every character has a presence score, including inanimate objects. Uh some spells can only affect certain amounts of presence or do you do things that much presence that's just how it calculates people so if you only affect 90 presence worth people and you and your friends all have 30 each you only affect yourself and two others uh allowing the effect uh some spells let you just auto fail the mr check if you want to if you want to be casting yourself uh target selection very self-explanatory. You, the spellcaster, picks who gets hit and who does not. Uh, however, you cannot deselect someone who you're not aware of is in the area. Uh, base magic resins. Uh, it's, you know, some spells might not have a MR check. Like if you want to resist a beneficial spell, for example. You treat the MR check as 120, as the base one. Uh, ghostly spells are weird. They are very common to be illusions in the illusion tree, but basically I like to call it theoretical damage. You get attacked by a ghostly spell. The effects of a ghostly spell aren't real. They can't normally kill you. If you're reduced to zero hit points by a ghostly spell, you're not actually dead. You're merely unconscious, usually. Uh, if you do a crit, like in the heart or something in the head, you can die of cardiac arrest, though. Uh, every five turns usually means that every five turns you get to make a magical resistance check. And then there's change in, in magic resistance where you might get another check if you change your MR to make it higher or lower to uh, get in the resist. So that's the, the basics of magic when it comes to spell casting. Let's go on to the more advanced stuff in the Arcana Exit uh, expansion book. Uh, this adds a lot to magic. I'm not going to be able to uh, do justice when it comes to everything you can do beyond the fact that you should know that there are n more uh, advantages. I'm not going to go through them because they're not important. That's something you can do in your free time. I'm just going to explain the basics of this adds. And I think if you're going to do magic and do it, you should really use these rules because they're very good. One other thing I like is consequences for accumulating high amounts of Xeon. This little chart's nice for flavor and stuff, and for giving you an idea of how obvious it is to when you're charging up Xeon and getting these ridiculous amounts of Xeon. And just a useful DM tool. Uh, another important mechanical thing is it also changes around some advantages and disadvantages of the book by adding the theorems of magic. Uh, to explain what these... Oh, these are some advantages. I'm just going to... So, Theorems of Magic, they change how you cast spells and what you can do with them. Uh, like this one, it is the Omniyodu. It's more realistic. You need like a fetish called Nafudu to cast spells. And basically, when you're creating one of these Afudu, you can uh, more or less like consume it to... Uh, to do weird things. I'm not, it's hard to explain, but these theorems basically mutate how you cast magic. I haven't honestly read through these very much. I personally ever, as a DM, I don't really use them all that often because it'd be weird for me to uh, make a wizard with these because it would be a lot of work for something that's not like, you know, going to mechanically benefit them in a way that's interesting for but some exception. There's the uh, voodoo theorem, where you basically can make voodoo dolls and make physical links between people, and can link them to link link people to things and do crazy shit like that. Uh, shamanism is uh, it's basically uh, using powerful spiritual zones and such. And if you're in the right area, you can basically call upon spirits. And also get more powerful effects for your magic. And the one I like the most, the one I would use a lot, is natural magic. Where if you use natural magic, uh, casting your... You don't really cast spells anymore. You instead make them. And you cast them by uh, 
investing Xeon and making checks for your power stats and make your own supernatural effects. The more Xeon you spend into it, the better, the easier it is to cast the spell. Uh, and it gives a lot of examples of effects, and then it gives you a nice chart of like, what this effect, what level this effect would be, and how hard it would be, and stuff like that. It lets you make your own spell, which is cool. And I like it. Uh, this is all optional. I wouldn't recommend always making a character with these level of uh, of these uh, theorems. Because base magic is complex enough as it is. But if you're looking to spice things up, I recommend reading through them. They're really cool. Uh, but as a DM, I find I don't usually... I don't really look through them all that often because it's more of a player thing. Uh, I think a lot of this book is really there to help players with their character. Uh, the most important addition to this uh, to this actually is uh, the meta magic advantages, and I'm gonna go into those and actually describe them in actual detail. Besides just saying, "Hey, look at that! It's cool." So first things first, I'm gonna show you this big tree, and then you go, "Dal, this tree doesn't make any sense upon first glance." And I'm just gonna explain to you the tree. So. There's these red numbers you see above the circles. This is a level requirement. To buy this sphere on the tree, you need to be level 4 at least, or higher. These numbers below are how many magic levels it costs you to buy a sphere. Now, how do you get onto this tree? How do you buy things from this tree? Well, you need to start at a corner of the tree to begin. So, you can start here. Here, 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 here. You can start basically at any like corner where there isn't a circle going from the back side out of it. So you can start at life magic or force speed or secure defense or any of those things basically. Any of the corners of the tree. Uh, and you buy it. And you can progress in the tree following these lines to get whatever you want. Uh, as long as you meet the level requirement. Uh, as you get further and closer into the middle, you'll generally get to more powerful spheres. And you might notice, looking over it, some of these spheres have the same ability in it. Uh, buying the same ability multiple times upgrades that ability. Now, there are is one node I want to point out to you guys that's right in the middle, the high magic node right here. At level 10. This is a way, mechanically, for a DM to say, hey, this is how you naturally get the high magic as a character in the game. You get level 10, and you progress down this tree, and you get there. Now, when I was describing magic levels earlier, it sounded like you guys had a lot of limits on how many magic levels you get. And there was no way to get them besides increasing your intelligence, which is, you know, would make going this tree very difficult. It would mean to go through the tree that you would have a lot less spells actually cast, which would suck. I agree, and so this book, uh, this book actually offers a way to buy magic levels. You spend five development points to get five magic levels. It's uh, it's kind of OP. I would recommend making it so it costs uh, more like five development points to get three magic levels. I know it's a weird ratio, but uh, if you do it the other way, where it's five for five, you will out, you will outpace the uh. I use the NPC stat blocks, like I've got a baseline, and assume players are a step above those more or less, is how to describe how powerful they are. So if you are this level as an Archmage in the book, you should probably be just a little bit more powerful than he is. If you go for the 5 revive, you will always have, be better than him. Like, by a country mile. No contest. No contest. The Archmage is your bitch. Uh, but with the 3 to 5, you're a bit closer to his power level, but at the same time, you're still stronger than him, which is where you want to be, obviously. Uh, but do what you want to do. 5 for 5 isn't actually all that overpowered, but it's it was the thing that me and my campaign did. Now, when it comes to uh, what these orbs actually mean, there are four branches. It tells you where the branches are. You have to start on them. Blah, 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 blah. Move to the tree. Uh, the one crap thing, you did that us consult this tree and then down to all these charts to figure out what it does. Each sphere increases the level of some of these abilities. Let's look at an example of, what is this one called? Defensive Expertise. It buffs up your shields. You spend more Xeon to get better projection onto your shield. And these spheres that you basically put more additional Xeon to get better benefits to your shield. So 20 more Xeon for 20 more projection to your shield. 40 for 40, 60 for 60. So 
so on and so forth. <coughs> there might be some limits. In this case, this advantage, this ability, does not stack with three access spell defensive air addition. This is probably to avoid some exploit, to be honest. Some don't get more powerful, like double damage, which just doubles the base damage while your offensive spell. Holy shit. No downside. So, that's where those are. It's the mechanical way to progress to high magic and stuff, and to get other cool abilities. I'm not going to go through them, because I still have one more topic to get through. Which is how you cast spells with the Arcana Exit rules. Now, if you want to use these rules for the base spells, you have to go online and download the, tran the translation in English. Because the uh, Anima 2nd Edition core rules, with that, with those spells have been translated into Spanish, is... Not in English yet, and may never be translated in English, unfortunately. But you can find online, there's like a Word document floating about where you can find all the spells. Where they're put in this format instead. I like this format way better. And you can see that it's much simpler. It tells you straight up how smart you gotta be to cast a spell. How much is you gotta you need to cast it. What the maintenance is. And what it does on a tier by tier basis. If you cast it at basic, it's 50 Xeon, you need 5 intelligence, 150 foot radius. This is what it does up here. This is its daily cost. Very simple. I would highly recommend using this. Even if it's your first campaign and you want to play by base rules, use these, spell, these spells. It's so much more simple. The only downside is that some of the spells in the book will become weaker if you go with the reworked spells. This is also a good thing, because some of these spells are Mondo overpowered. I'm going to give you one example of a very overpowered spell in the core rulebook, which has no limits to how powerful it is, more or less. It's the, uh, I believe, the spell I want in the Earth Tree. I'm just going to... It's not even the most overpowered thing in this game, by the way. It's just, you know, everything in this game is overpowered. I'm just looking for it. It might be in Destruction. Oh, no, here it is. Uh, Meteor. So... It does what it says it does. Now, the downside of the meteor is there's like a 10 turn delay potentially on the meteor itself when it comes down. But it's one additional like effect is an extra meteor. So, if you are fighting an unsuspected foe, you can drop like a, a fuck ton of meteors on these guys. Now, granted, to cast meteor, you need 10 intelligence just to even cast it. But once you get more than 10, you know, once you get to 11, that's two more meteors. And so on and so forth. Uh, and that's magic, really. That's everything you need to know about magic. When it comes to being a player character, being the wizard class, or the warlock, or the illusionist, is that you cast spells. And as a recap, to just go over everything you went through like, really quickly, to really explain all these again. Zeon is mana. You use Zeon to cast spells. Magical accumulation is how you charge up your Zeon to cast spells. When you're casting an offensive spell or a defensive spell to protect yourself, you use magical projection to protect yourself. Now, the only uh, now when it comes to spells and stuff, when it comes to your projection, keep in mind that projection is also determining how far that spell can go. So although you might be casting a healing spell or you might be shielding your ally, and normally it wouldn't make sense for you to cast magical projection to give your ally a buff, you might roll a projection check just to get far enough to get to him, for example. Uh, and yeah, your spells also can be used creatively. Like, shield spells can be used on allies, it's all good shit. And there you have it, that's how you do magic in anima. Very simple, very easy in my opinion, once you get down to it. But like everything in anima, I recommend treating it like, uh, hmm, treating it like an onion. The onion has many, many layers. I recommend going one layer at a time and taking the game nice and slow. It's much easier to understand if you learn things by making a character and playing that character. That includes you, aspiring animal dungeon masters. Don't jump into the book and suddenly make five monsters, one for each like, you know, archetype of warrior, summoner, wizard, martial artist, uh, other warrior, acrobat, you know, like learn the mechanics one at a time. And really absorb them in, because the the game is complicated, right? It's just that. So be careful. 
make sure to, to read through everything and as as always like i have told you again take it slow anima beyond fantasy isn't a race it's an experience and one you should take carefully uh i think my next video will probably be on either the, i think i'm gonna go through all of the disciplines i've talked about basic characters i've talked about combat i've talked about magic i think the next logical step would be summoning so my next video will be on summoning i'll try and make it sooner than this video in relation to the other two i've made but the next one will be on summoning uh further note for this channel i'm gonna be sticking to these kind of tutorial videos and anima as well as on uh world building and more into writing than anything else really like you know how to write an anima campaign how to write an adventure how to how to build your world so it's not boring and just full of encounters, for example. Uh, but anyways, that's for future. This is the now. I hope you guys enjoyed. And if you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that shit. And yeah, I hope you guys have a great day.